What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Limitless Business Owners Podcast. My name is Andrew Georgie, and I'm here with my co-host of the podcast, Dan Fisher. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, first of all, we want to welcome you. Okay, we're super excited to be on this journey, this business owner journey with you, and help you along the way. Okay, our whole goal with this podcast and really our passion in life is to bring the everyday business owner content and stories they can relate to, and also fresh new perspectives, fresh new mindsets, new thoughts, new ideas, strategies, tactics to help you grow your business. Okay, if you take one thing out of each episode and start implementing it into your life and business today, we promise you're going to start seeing massive growth. Let's hop into the show. Today's top topic is uh, something that I'm super passionate about. Okay, and we're going to be talking about leadership. All right. And I think regardless of what kind of business owner you are, you first have to be a leader, right? You have to have a skill of leadership and you, you can, you can build that. You can, you can acquire the skills to become a better leader. Okay. Today we have a special guest with us, CEO of a massive accounting firm out in St. George, Utah, really just an awesome guy. Uh, this podcast wouldn't exist without him, right? He's mm-hmm. the guy that, that told us that encouraged us to start this puppy launch our group. And I think within a week we did. So we need that. We need that little kick in the side from, from Mr. Kaysen Jennings. Kaysen, welcome to the show. Perfect. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited and uh, glad to be able to, to, to be on here today. I'm following some pretty cool dudes and I'm on here with some awesome dudes and just absolute killers in business. And if you're driving down the road, listen to this podcast or sit in your office today. If nothing else, I hope it just raises your energy that you can carry throughout the day with you and, and uh, set you up for, for success and for a good win. Yeah. Case, Kaysen's coming out of tax season. So it's been been nuts for him, I'm sure. Kaysen, tell us a little bit of how, how that's been going. It's been, uh, it's been busy, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> We've got... Uh, so we, we've grown over the years and uh, we've grown really, really fast over the last few years. And so, you know, every, everybody thought that uh, the, the government extending the tax deadlines was helping people out. And it was just killing it for accounting firms because everybody still waits till the last minute. So you've got stuff trickling in. And so I feel like we, we came out of tax season and went right back into another one, but uh, I've got an incredible team. I've got a COO that's just absolutely awesome. I've got a CFO that handles business. And, and uh, you know, this, this year was great for us. We, we, we found a lot of holes in our business and, and I'm excited for tax season to be over because now we have time to plug those holes and put better systems and processes in place. So all in all, it's been a great year for us. Awesome. Dan, I know you, you, you use, you know, for your business, you use easier accounting and mm-hmm. I know you've had great things to say. So um, yeah. And I'm one of those ones that procrastinate and honestly, I, I needed as much help as possible. So like uh, I'm over here listening to the case and saying, yeah, the guys are procrastinating. I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> as I sink down in my chair. Um, but yeah, it's like, it, it's, he's his business and the guys that we work with, like uh, right now we're working with Trevor, uh, as our accountant and he's doing amazing stuff for us. So I uh, can't speak more highly uh, of you guys. And uh, I can't speak uh, with the other word, uh, the opposite of my skills. So I really need you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. The case is, I mean, you could already kind of hear just from what he's talking about his team. He goes straight to his team first, really mm-hmm. is an extraordinary leader. Um, and, has an amazing story. So case and man, the floor is yours with your story. We'd love to hear yeah. how, how you got, you know, wherever you want to start, you know, to, you know, how you became the CEO of easier accounting. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it pretty far back with you guys, if that's okay. Yeah. And kind of share my life's journey. I, I, uh, I've had the pleasure of being on stage a couple of times in front of some, you know, decent sized audience in front of business owners. And, you know, last time I was on stage, right before I got on stage, I, it hit me. And I was like, it, it absolutely blows my mind that I get the pleasure today to not only be around the people that I'm around and have the team that I have and, and be asked to be on amazing podcasts like this, but really to talk about getting your finances straight, which is essentially what my business does. For me to be that guy talking to people, it, it's just absolutely crazy. I do not come from a, a home where there was any type of financial education at all. I mean, we Growing up, we we were on. Um, I was raised by a mom on disability, and uh, and 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 we got a lot of government help, and we knew when the 
when the food stamps ran out and we knew when they were going to show up again. And that was about the, uh, wow. the extent of financial education. But for me, just as a human being and, and what made me who I am today, I was born in St. George, Utah, growing up, couldn't wait to get away from it. Now I think it's the best place in the world and I don't ever want to leave. Um, it looks beautiful there. It, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, there's something for everybody. Um, and, uh, but it, it's also a great community for salespeople and entrepreneurs. It's a, Utah's a very, very entrepreneurial state and it's a very competitive community. We have a very, very strong uh, um, middle class in Utah and, and I wasn't a part of the middle class, um, w which is the, the best thing that ever happened to me. But yeah. growing up, my parents got a divorce when I was four years old. And I, I kind of wanted up being the pawn in that divorce. Um, didn't really get to see my dad much again until I was 19. And we have a great relationship now that I'm grateful for. But there was a lot of marriages and divorces in between the ages of four and 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 even now. Um, and so there was there was a lot of financial instability. There was a lot of my mom would date a guy, get married, we'd move in. A year or two later, however long it was, divorce not have anywhere to live. Um, and then, <clears throat> and, and kind of being the pawn in the divorce, I, I, I grew up with this belief that, that my, my dad and his side of the family didn't love me and didn't want me in their life. Um, and so I thought there was something wrong with me. That was the story I was told and I believed it. Um, so my whole life, I always thought there was something wrong with me. Yeah. Okay. And, that set me on a journey of I can't fail because if I fail, I'm a failure and I'm already not loved. And so taking risks and things like that, which are at the core, what allow you to build confidence as a human being, I didn't do it. And so when I was 10 years old, my mom remarried and we went to, uh, we moved to Salt Lake with her new husband. Um, and, uh, when we got to Salt Lake, I apologize, my voice a little bit raspy. I was getting over a cold, but, <laughs> but when we moved to Salt Lake, I, I, I really struggled to make friends. Um, and I went into junior high and, and wanted up being, being the kid that got picked on a lot. Um, and I just, I would take it cause I felt like I deserved it deep down to be honest with you. Um, and getting picked on by people was better than getting no attention at all for me. Right. Mm -hmm. At least I got some sort of attention from my peers at school. Um, but again, I, I had no confidence. I uh, was afraid to take risks um, in ninth grade. A, a business across the street from my junior high went out of business and it reopened as a gym. There we go. And I was like, you know what? It's about damn time I do something about this whole getting <laughs> on thing. And I, I had no idea at that point how to build confidence, what confidence was, like what the right path was. But I knew that I was sick and tired of being picked on. And, you know, I would see the muscle magazines and the guys that were super fit. And it's like, that's what I want. Like, I, I bet those guys get chicks and they don't get picked on. Right. <laughs> and that's what I wanted. You know, I'm, I'm this 14 year old kid. I want to pick up on chicks. and I don't want to get picked on anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a gym pass. And I made it a point, you know, every single day after school, I walked my ass across the street to that gym. I taught myself how to lift via magazines and things like that. And I worked out every single day. And on the weekends, I'd walk from my house every day. I'd go to the gym. I'd spend three, four hours a day in the gym. And, uh, you know, I what happened is it, it literally became like, a passion, an addiction, whatever you want to call it. At first, I didn't love going to the gym, but I loved the feeling that I got when I left. And because of the dedication and the commitment, all of a sudden I started to build confidence. And after I started to build confidence, I started to make friends, started to get attention from the girls. It was working, right? <laughs> it, it was Fun working and I, and I was loving it. And, you know, it, it, but I mean, I, I, I literally had this goal that I was going to get in shape and I didn't, and I didn't negotiate on that goal for shit. Like yeah. there was no excuses. 
And so I was able to learn and I didn't realize till later on in life that at that point I learned how to build confidence and, and, you know, habits that allow you to become successful. So fast forward a couple of years later and, you know, the, the crowd that I had kind of started to fit in with started getting to party in. And I realized that, uh, you know, if, if I started to drink or, or use a drug, put a substance in my body, that confidence that I had been chasing for years in the gym came to me a whole lot faster. Mm. I didn't have to go to the gym and put in the reps to get it. And it was working for me. And it worked for me for, for you know, a couple of years. And, uh, you know, the, the alcohol, the pot turned into a lot harder drugs. And, you know, at... at uh, I went through about a 10 year period of my life where I was in and out of, of jail and rehab, like just, it was just this cycle. And anytime I would get out of jail or rehab, I'd stay clean for a couple of months. I'd always wind up getting a good job in sales or doing whatever, you know, and uh, I would do well at it and I'd wind up right back on drugs. Hmm. And so something that has always been a goal for me my whole entire life was to to have a family and be able to provide the stability that i didn't have growing up i wanted to have a wife i wanted to have kids and you know i got to the point where there was so much uh, financial uh, baggage i guess so much shit that i had to clean up from years of addiction, whether it be, I mean, I, I had overdosed multiple times and been in the hospital, had no insurance. So my medical bills were through the roof. My credit was just absolutely terrible. And, um, when I was 26, I went to rehab for the last time. And I remember every time being in jail and rehab, knowing what my ultimate goal was, which was to be a husband and father someday and provide stability for a family. And the biggest thing that would stress me out is at this stage of the game, why get clean and stay clean? Because I, I didn't think I'd ever be able to clean up the wreckage yeah, from the past. So much. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I made a decision the last week that I was in rehab, um, the last time that I went and, uh, and, and I made a decision. I don't know how I'm going to do it or what I'm going to do, but I absolutely am going to make six figures this year. And at that point in my life, six figures was a lot of money. I was like, if I can just get to where I'm making $10,000 a month, I'm set for the rest of my life, <laughs> which we all, most yeah. of the listeners listen to this. We all know now <laughs> that's not exactly the case. Yep. Um, but um, I, I had no plan, didn't know what I was going to do. I got out of rehab and a kid that I was in rehab with had just gotten a sales job at a marketing company. And so... I went and, and they, they, they would train you on Monday and Tuesday at this marketing company. And then they put you on the phones Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And the, the, the deal was, you know, by Friday, your first week, you had to have make three sales or you were out. You didn't have a job. And so Friday was an early day. We left at three and at, uh, it was like one o'clock and we took a quick break and the owner of the company came up to me. And he's like, hey, dude, you're a cool dude. I'd love to hang out with you outside of work, but it's one o'clock. We're leaving in two hours. You're at zero sales. Let's just not waste your time. I'll pay you out for a full week and uh, and you're out. And I was like, no, dude, I'm, I'm not done. Get, put me back on the phone. And so I got back on the phone and closed the next three phone calls. Wow. Boom, boom, boom. Back Look to back that. closed. It kept my job. And. You know, I, I knew that I had an ability to sell, but I was so beat down for years. My, my confidence that I had built was gone. Yeah. Um, it, but I, I started to gain a little bit of confidence back in it. And, it, and by this point I was back in my routine. I was, I, mm -hmm. I'm very, very routine driven. I have the same routine every single day. Um, and so I closed three deals, back-to-back -back phone calls. Two weeks later, I was running that entire company. Holy smokes. <laughs> and and uh, but I felt bad. The kid that got me the job was a close friend of mine. I actually had to fire him like a month oh, after that, Wow, <laughs> which was rough. That's that's one of the things with being a leader in a company that, yep. that the, the shitty stuff that comes along with it, the hard phone, mm -hmm. uh, the hard conversations you have to have and yeah. getting rid of people that you love and care about. But yeah, I had to fire the kid. And then I met uh, Kel and Trevor. They they own Easier Accounting. They've owned it for years and years and years. 
And um, I met him at the gym. They're like, hey, we love your energy. We want you to come interview with yeah. us. And uh, they, they, uh, I, I, I didn't know this then, but I know now they, at that point, they didn't even need me or have a spot for me. They were having to get rid of somebody to bring me in. Amazing. And uh, so whatever they saw in me, I, I don't know. Yeah. They saw something. I remember I came in for the interview and I was just like, or, or I had told them like a week before we interviewed, I was like, Hey guys, uh, you know, I've, I've done the whole sales thing. I've done door to door sales. I've done car sales. I, I, I know the kind of money you guys are telling me I can make, but you to leave what I have mm -hmm. right now, you guys have got to show me the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so when they called me to come in for the interview, I had lost my voice and they're like, Hey, as long as the sales manager likes you, um, then, then you're good. So I, I come in for the interview. I had no voice. They showed me the numbers of what every single salesman there had made that year. And this is in like May and most of them had already made over a hundred thousand that year. Wow. So I'm like, okay, this is the real deal. Like, I've never in my life, like one of my biggest fears is being average. I yeah. don't like average. I don't want to be average. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing in my mind was so far out of reach. I was like, I hope I can just come in there and be like the bottom guy and, and make, you know, close to what these guys are making and make enough to keep my job. And uh, so I went in there. All I could say in the interview to the sales manager, I was supposed to try to get him to like me and want to hire me was when do I start? Apparently he liked that attitude and, and I started the next Monday. <laughs> but something happened at that point um, that I, I'd never had before. I finally had mentors. I came into this company and, you know, to this day, one of, if not my closest friend, was that sales manager that hired me. When I came in, I don't know what he saw in me. I don't know what Kel saw in me. I don't know what Trevor saw in me. But at that point, I still didn't love or care about myself. But they saw something in me I didn't see about in myself. And they they took me under their wing. Um, you know, they helped me get my medical bills taken care of. They helped me get my credit cleaned up, you know, and, and just like my taxes. I didn't file taxes in nine years. I was working in a tax and accounting firm. I hadn't filed taxes in nine years. That's so, amazing. They helped me get absolutely everything cleaned up. And because I had these mentors and could see how they were living their life, I just started to mimic that. Mm. Like, you know, one guy bought a road bike and started getting to road biking. I went and bought a road bike and started riding with him. I'm like, he's riding. I want to be around him as much as yeah. I can. I was single, no kids. You know, I had no commitments. All I had to do was work. Yep. And, I, and I've always loved working. So that part came easy to me. So that first year there, out of, you know, nine salesmen, however many we had, I ended up being number three. There we go. Um, the next year, I ended up being number two, and I was number, I lost the, being the top salesman by like $4,000, not even an entire Jeez. sale. <laughs> and I and I sat down and I said, this will never fucking happen again. <laughs> I finally realized that I had what it take to be a top producer and to be yep. the best. And so every year we sit down, you know, as a team with the leaders in the company and we go over our goals the first part of the year. And when I sat down, the sales manager at the time and, uh, and the owners, Kel and Trevor, I, I told him, I says, Hey, this year I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do over a million. And they're like, hey, good luck. None of us have even done that. We've been in business since two, since 2002. Not even the owners have, have done that. Good luck. Wow. I says, I'm going to be the top salesman. I'm going to do over a million this year. And uh, I, I was willing to do, like in my mind, there was nothing that would get away, that, that would get in the way of that. And uh, Kel and Trevor, they said, we don't know what we're going to get you, but if you pop a million, which we doubt you will, but if you do, we're going to buy you something real nice. So fast forward, like September, end of September, beginning of October, I bust a million oh, bucks. And there's still, wow. there's still room left um, in the year. <laughs> there is. <laughs> there's still room left in the year. I was also the top salesman that year. Um, I tracked everything I did every single Friday before I left the office to come back again on Saturday and Sunday. 
I went like four and a half years where I took two one week vacations and that was it. Wow. So 14 days off and four, four and a half years. Um, cause I, I could see like, okay, we have this database full of, of, of leads, people to call that need right. our services, but they've never picked up the phone. Then I saw the other salesman, <coughs> excuse me, they're just working Monday through Friday. So I'd come in on Saturday and Sunday just to hit that database full of leads. Like, Hey, if they're not picking up Monday through Friday, maybe they're Saturday, Sunday people. Yep. And, and it worked out for me, but I would track everything. So I would keep a sticky note on my desk and it had every single salesman's numbers current to the week for what they'd sold that year. And then I had another sticky note that showed the exact dollar amount of what the next person in line to me was and how far away we were. Hmm. So, you know, I, it, it was always like the top salesman in the company would, would get it by like, you know, 10,000, 12,000, $15,000, whatever it was. When did out the year, I was like 250 something thousand dollars away from Holy the next smokes. guy closest to me. Jeez. So anyhow, they, Kel and Trevor kept good on their promise. They bought me a Rolex and we, we started, nice. we started a new club at our work called the Millionaires Club for the salesmen. <laughs> and anytime you, you, you get in that club, you get a really nice watch. And uh, the crazy thing is, so been in business since 02, nobody had popped a million years. People that have been with the company for years and years and years almost every single sales we have is in the millionaires club. It's now. just, and wow. that's just from that you created this. I mean, essentially you, I shouldn't say you created the sales culture, but you, you set the bar higher, showed people that it's attainable. And now people are attaining it. Correct. And they want to emulate them. Yep. Correct. And there was, there was a, a, a lot of, a, a lot of drama and problems I had to go through to get to that point. Cause when you're in a culture of salespeople mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's a sense of it. That's every man for himself, which we've, we've changed that. Now we're a team, we're yeah. a family, we work together, everybody's happy for each other. But I mean, I, I was like, it just, the, the next guy that I was always competing with, um, you know, uh, just the complaints that I would get, the things that would happen. And that's just some of the shit you have to deal with. You know, they say it's lonely at the top and there's parts of it where, where there are, when you, when you start to outshine in, in an environment where people have reached a level of comfort, it's going to piss some people off and, and it happens, but it's okay. And, and it, 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 the culture takes a dip, but then it always gets better. In my opinion, it's like, you know, two steps back or one step back, two Absolutely. steps forward, you know, as far as the culture goes, but yeah, the, the next year I'd, I'd done the million by like, I think it was August or something like that. <laughs> and then after that year, you know, they're like, Hey, case, and we're, we're going to make you the sales manager. And so it, it was crazy because the guys that taught me how to sell that mentored me that were my bosses when I came in or that had been there for years now got told that they worked for me. Right. And I did well as the sales manager grew the company um, pretty well. And then, you know, the next year they're like, Hey, uh, we, we kind of want to take a step back from the business. We've taken it as far as we feel like we can get it. So this is your baby. Now let's continue to grow. And so th that's pretty much how I got to, to where I'm at today. There's so much in there. That's the amazing. sales stuff alone. I mean, um, being a part of sales, I used to sell, uh, like high end outdoor power equipment. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, we actually had like a no commission, uh, type environment, but the salespeople thrived. I mean, we got after it, you know? Um, but it's like one of those things, like everything that you did, I'm sure all the systems that you created for yourself, that's what, like, that's what allowed you to get to a million, allowed you to do it. And how much of that did you end up rolling out into the sales department to help others after that? Yeah, all of it. Yeah. All of it. I, I wanted everybody to win. I'll, I'll tell you, I hired a new sales guy probably like a month ago, two months ago. He's been an absolute stud. And, um, but his first day in the office, I, I had him in a little cubicle and I was like, Hey, you come in and kill it and we'll get you your own office. He says, I don't want any office. I want your office. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. come here, brother. 
Nice. Please come get my <laughs> office because that just means I'm moving up. You know, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that, that people make as business owners or when they're running a company, they think that they have to know everything and that, that they have to like be the one that teaches everybody else. And it's only their ideas that fly with inside yeah. the company. And that mindset will cripple a business so fast. Like I want guys to come in and absolutely crush me. Great companies are not built by one great mind. They're built by a lot of great minds that work together. Well, and, right. and yeah, go ahead, I want to go back real quick. No, no, no. no. S- sorry, Andrew. Um, going into this story that you were talking about with uh, how you were working out at the gym with uh, Trev and Cal, and they were, um, you're like, I don't know what they saw. I, I want to take you back to that moment and almost be like, what? So I, I think it's more in my eyes, I think it's more of like the go getter obviously go-getters are rare and um, you know, you didn't see it that way cause you were in that, that moment. But if you were back in that moment and you were going to find someone that had maybe recruit them the same way, what would you be looking for? So I'm always looking for, you know, a, a similar mindset to mine, um, you know, where, where I'm managed, run the company. Now I I'm always looking for exactly what you said, people that are go-getters because I want people that will come in and, and raise the bar just like I did with the company. I don't want somebody to come in and be an average salesperson, right? That's average salespeople are a dime a dozen and every company needs to have their average salespeople. Not every salesman you have is just gonna be an absolute A team player that kills it. But if right. I'm looking for somebody, you know, I, I think that you, I'm always looking for that one person, whether I have a spot from within my company or not. If I find you and I think that you're a go-getter, you've got a good head on your shoulders, you're highly motivated, you don't take no for an answer, um, you know, I want you, I, I will make room for you with inside my company. But some things that show me that somebody's a go-getter are people that do not negotiate on their goals, okay? So for example, if if when I do an interview, I, I do not want to see a resume ever. Somebody brings me in a resume. The first thing I do is throw it away and I tell them, hey, I don't give a shit where you've been or what you've done in the past. I don't care if you sold a damn thing in your life. I don't care what companies you work for. I really don't give a damn about any degrees that you have. That means nothing to me. What I want to yep. see is your goals. And so I'll meet with them and kind of <clears throat> do a temperature check on where they're at in life. And then I'll do a second interview. And in every second interview that I have with people, I make them bring their Mm -hmm. goals in. I want to see short term goals, midterm goals and long term goals. Um, That tells me where you're at, where you're looking to go, um, kind of the level of thinking that you have for yourself. But it also tells me if my company can be a good fit and provide you with what you need. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. So I've never thought of hiring that way. Never. Never, ever, 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 ever. First time I've ever heard that. Yeah, because right. you taught the exact opposite as far as like bringing in the resume. Make sure you're make sure you work your two years so you get it for your next <laughs> job or whatever it is. Um, I don't know how many times I told I've been told that. I mean, I went through thirty one jobs before I started my own, and not a single one cared about how long I was. Now, um, I was never fired, and there was never any like negative instances, and I was always trying to be the best at what I was in that like on that resume or on that job. And that's what I think that you did. I think you did a really, really good job of being the best at each sales position. You weren't necessarily eyeing up CEO before you were, um, you know, in the, in the seats before that. Yeah. It's, uh, pretty amazing. I mean, in, in, you, I kind of think of what goes on for people like, like from a leader standpoint case in there, it's like you were actually shining the light back on them a little bit. Like, what are your mm-hmm. goals? Where do you want to end up? How like that? I, I just think about myself. If I went in an interview like that, I would want to work for that person, and that probably is what allows you to attract probably some top talent. But even and when I say top talent, I'm not talking about you go and get a guy that's been doing sales for 15 years. That's a rock star. I'm talking like the intangibles, like the top talent that right. uh, some of the you know I'm sure some of the sales skills might need to be cultivated a little bit. Um, but they have the intangibles of being the go-getter, of working hard, of being the first person to show up, of, of having sure. those goals. Like those things you can't teach people. Very, very tough to teach that that inner drive um, to people. Typically, they have to go through I, something to get that. 
I'll be honest with you. If somebody comes into my office and they've got 15 years um, in sales that they've done well at, I don't want them. Hmm. I don't want them because if you've been killing it and a top producer for 15 years, you should be in a leadership yeah. role within that company. And if you haven't been there yet, then, you know, I, I need people to come in and take my job for me yeah. so that I can do more. And and even right. just, you know, being a leader. And, and, and this is the thing is, Kaysen was a leader before he stepped into a sales manager role. He decided, and, and without realizing right. it, or maybe you did realize it. You decided to take on kind of the problem of, hey, how do I get a salesperson to a million dollars? It's a big, I mean, well, no, it's not a huge problem. wasn't killing the company, but how much could have that each salesperson get into a million dollars? How much growth is going to happen? So you took that on, you created a system for that essentially. And now they're using that system to get every salesperson. Most of the salespeople do a million dollars. That's pretty, and, and, and that's why I say he's a leader before he was even you know, coined a leader with a title. I Yeah, I want to touch back yep. on that for just a second because I think it's important. I think a lot of people, when they get into a position, <clears throat> excuse me again, whatever that may be, I think a lot of people that are, are high achievers, they do want that leadership role, but they want the title or they want to be the leader. For me, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to me is my upbringing that I had, um, the things that I've gone through, because I, I, at that point I was, I was great. I was so grateful for the opportunity that was in front of me. I was willing to do whatever it took, but also like, I, I didn't have the, the, at that point, I didn't know that I had a goal yeah. to be a leader. I didn't know that I wanted to run the company or be the CEO or anything like that. What I did that allowed me to lead without even knowing it is I just became a person that people wanted to follow. Mm. And I think, you know, as a leader, there's, there's only one way to lead and that's by example. And I live by that today. I will still, you know, I will still work Saturday and Sunday if I need to, I will still work seven days a week and I do it very often. I will still leave the office at 10 or 11 o'clock so that my team can get home to their families at seven, whatever the case may be. I will lead by example, but leading by example or, 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 you know, acting as you're a leader doesn't necessarily happen until you are a leader. You have to first become a person of integrity, a person of action so that people actually want to follow you. That's what makes people trust you. You know, um, when you are not just saying what you're doing, but you just go do it. You just take the action. You just go do it. Correct. Um, you show integrity in your actions um, and that builds trust with those around you. And I love that of, you know, it's not being a leader, but I wanted to be someone that people wanted to follow. I became someone that people wanted to follow. Um, and, and, and like I said, that that's for anyone. It doesn't matter what role you're in. You can be mm -hmm. a person that people want to follow. Right. And um, you see those p people get the opportunity, but only because they're willing to do the extra things. Kaysen worked Saturday and Sundays called the leads that people didn't call. Uh, he took the opportunity. He took it a step further, um, made some opportunity, made some lemonade out of lemons there, really. Um, absolutely. But no, I, I mean, gosh, there's so much. And I, I think, you know, with leadership, um, and this is where I think a lot of leaders get it, get it wrong. Um, how much are you about your people and not just yourself, Kaysen. How much, how much is it? And because I, I know like Trevor and Kale, your sales manager, they, what they, they were a leader to you, right? They took you under their wing. They pulled you up. It was For about sure. you. It was about Kaysen. It wasn't about Trevor, Kale and your sales manager thinking what, it, Oh, what's, what are we going to get out of it right now? It was truly caring about you. Um, so I, I, I want you to touch on that caring for your people. How much, how important is that in leadership? Um, and can you fake that? So, no, I don't think you can't fake it. Um, you, you can fake it for a yeah. while, but it'll catch up to you. Um, so it, it, it's all about action. It's not what you tell them. You know, people can read through the lines. It doesn't take, take long to figure out the bullshit. If you're telling everybody you care about them, but your actions mm -hmm. show something different, People figure that out real quick. And there are certain things that, you know, within a company are so, so important. Number one, 
Um, the most important thing is, is as a leader, you have to have a vision for your company that allows everybody that works for you for their visions to fit with inside your company vision, right? That goes back to talking about the goals. Can my company help you achieve your goals? Here's what our vision is. Do you fit into that? Okay. Based off of the vision, you've got to have a culture. And I think that's where truly caring about your people come in. If you don't truly care about your people and they figure that out, then your culture is going to suck. And for me, with my company, you know, one of, one of the things that, that, that's super important to me is that this is a place where people actually want to show up to work, right? Dan, remind me how many jobs you said you had. 41. How many? 31. 31. Out of all those jobs you've had, have you ever had a job, and I, I bet we all have, where you literally get in your car and it's like, holy shit, there, I'm one stoplight closer to getting to the office. <laughs> yes. Right? I used to I used to wish that, or I used to hope that I would, I mean, this is a weird thing to say, but I used to hope that I would get in a car accident because I'm like, that means That's I extreme, can call man. No lie. That's extreme, man. <laughs> That was extreme, but that was it. If I die early this morning, I'll get the day off of work. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's that bad, right? Yep. No, I think every single person has has had that job or multiple jobs. For me, I had a, I've had a ton of those jobs where I I just absolutely hated working there. And yep. looking back on it, I know for a fact that I wasn't the only person with inside that company. In fact, most of the people felt the same way. And I know for an absolute fact that company did not get the best out of us. So if I can provide a place where my people truly know that I care about them, where we keep a great culture, right? And they want to show up to work. I know I'm going to get more loyal and, and, and better employees out of it. Um, Another thing, you know, as a leader that I think is important to touch on, um, you know, going from being a top salesman where I got all the company praise, you know, I, I would leave for a couple of days and people would be walking around the office and, and you know, Kason says you guys aren't going to be able to sell shit because he ain't here, which was them just trying to motivate the rest of the team. I never said anything like that. But stuff like that, you know, you come back, you hear people saying stuff like that. It feels good. You're getting Absolutely. all the praise. You're getting all the credit, right? Mm -hmm. When you go into a leadership role, I think it's important that you get comfortable not taking the credit and giving mm -hmm. all the credit to your team. Right. And at the same time, if anything happens, it is 100% your fault as the leader. Mm -hmm. If one of my employees makes a mistake, it is 100% my fault as a leader. Right. And mistakes aren't a bad thing, right? We, we are we, we are humans. I want all of my people to make mistakes, but if somebody makes a mistake that costs me money, I'm not going to tear them down for it because that's just me investing wow. into their education. That's me investing into them becoming a better employee. Wow. I love it. And I think you do a really good job of setting expectations. I'm, clearly, whenever you do the interview, yeah. you start at the beginning when you're like, hey, let's hear your goals. So then you kind of refocus um, the spotlight on them, like Andrew said. And it, it ultimately sets the expectations from day one. Is there anything else that you set expectations like, I don't know, first week or month or something that's a little bit different? So um, I would say yes and no. I don't do um, anything like, hey, you, this has to be done by this date or else you lose your job. I, I don't I don't use fair taxes or anything like that. But with my sales team, mm -hmm. um I wouldn't necessarily call it an expectation to keep their job, but it definitely helps um, if they do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm constantly pushing on and preaching personal development and sharing the things that I'm doing for personal development. So for me, you know, obviously the goal if you're in sales is to make money, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm always trying to share with people what they can do to become better salespeople. For me, when when I was when I was winning as the top salesperson, I wasn't winning. I wasn't beating everybody else inside of the office. It was my habits outside of the office that allowed me to come in and become a better salesperson. So for example, some of the things that I do, I want to prime myself every day to be the absolute best by the time I walk through the door to my office. Okay. So 
every single morning I'm up at the exact same time. Um, almost every single morning I have two workouts in before I get to my office. Okay. That helps me, you know, decrease my level of stress, my level of pressure, prime my mind already get me in kind of that, you know, I, I would yeah. say that killer's mindset, um, or the, just a, a winner's type of mindset. And so I, I, I preach that same stuff. When my guys come in, I invite them to come to the gym with me in the morning. I'll get them gym passes if I need to. Um, I, I invite them to come over on the weekends and see what I do when I'm outside of the office so that I can try to teach them a lot of the same habits that have Absolutely. helped me become who I am today. And the people that follow it always wind up doing better. Mm-hmm. I've seen proof of it. I've seen it on your Facebook stories and your, in your, your photos, just having fun with the guys and the, and the girls you have on the team. And it's, uh, I mean, you do a really good job of like, uh, showing that company culture. Yeah. And I mean, gosh, there's so many things I want to touch on. I mean, cause I mean, everything you're saying, case, and like I said, it goes, it goes right back to what people want out of a company. Uh, they want someone that's going to be doing that. They want to know they're cared for. They want someone they can trust. They want some a leader that can say, "Hey, my bad, I did I, this. That was on me," you know. Um, and I, I feel like so many places, so many people fake that so much. They love to. This is going to be me going on a soapbox. They love to text nice things, but then when it comes down to the action of it, it's empty. It's there's there's nothing there. You know, um, and I know we can all identify leaders that have, have done that to us before, um, maybe made promises, or if you're going to make a promise, say, Hey, um, I can't, when well, I'm not able to, to do that and reset the expectations. But, um, I mean, there's so many, sure. And there's probably a reason why your people come to you, <laughs> you know, and, and, and go along that journey with you. I, I think with inside of a company, you've yep. got leaders and you've got managers and you need both of them, but you also got to be really good and really quick to identify yep. who is what, you know, for the most part, I want leaders, leaders elevate the team and elevate the culture managers, you know, keep an eye on day to day. And, uh, you know, there, there's mm -hmm. most certainly a difference between the two. And I, I don't, for me with inside my company, I don't see a need to have, you know, a leader managing and I definitely don't see a need to have a, a manager leading, right? I, I want both Absolutely. both sides of the equation. Let's talk a little bit about beginning or beginner business owners. Okay, um, they may not have any employees, right? Um, they may not view themselves um, in terms of a leader, right? Um, that light bulb hasn't clicked yet, right? They don't think of themselves like, hey, I don't have any employees, so I'm not a leader. How much does being a leader impact? how clients and customers come approach you? I think it 100% impacts. I mean, we've all, we've all been in that position where the customer calls in and they want to talk to the, yeah. they want to talk to the manager or the owner. Right. And so I think that how you conduct yourself most certainly impacts, you know, your, your client's perception of you or, or, mm -hmm. you know, anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. Dan, you have any any questions you want to ask him? Yeah, one thing that came to mind whenever you were talking about like how you took the opportunity to go street ride, street bike riding with with your with your boss at the time, sales manager. Yeah, my boss. Um, you know, where does open mindedness come into play? Because you had to be pretty open minded to be like, I'm going to go buy. I'm going to go ride bike. with my boss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, right. <clears throat> you know, for me at that point. I didn't, I didn't know much. All I knew is that what I did know wasn't, wasn't enough to, to, to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And so for me, it was very easy because there was a, a huge level of humility there. So it, it mm -hmm. came very, very easy to me. And I, I think that it doesn't matter what level you're on in life. There's, there's always someone at a, at a higher level. Mm -hmm. And if you're a manager, a leader running a company, you know, I, I think it's important to always be grateful, but never be satisfied. Yes. So I, I think being open minded to trying out new things and, you know, doing things that your mentors are doing that you maybe didn't see yourself doing before is extremely important because you never know what it is that's going to work. 
But if you had all the answers yourself, you'd be in the same position as that person that you're looking up to or that's mentoring you. So I think, I think open-mindedness is, and willingness is just absolutely huge. What about for Love it. maybe the seasoned vet business owner, the, the person that does have employees? Um, maybe they're thinking, hey, I, I, I need to place more of an importance on my leadership, how I treat my people and my culture. What are some things that they could be doing right now um, to pivot their culture, kind of to a leadership culture, making themselves more? Because I, I know some people that have been at it, they can get stuck in their ways. They can suck. Hey, I've always done this. I'm I'm the person that does this. They don't think others can just hop in and empower them. Yeah, and and I think that kind of goes mm-hmm. back to that closed mindedness key, where you know maybe taking an honest look at yourself and 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 realize that that maybe you are a bottleneck with inside your business and taking responsibility for that. And there's a lot of things that you can do from there if you've got employees and you've got people that are key players and and maybe you've got some you know control issues with inside the company when it where you want to control everything if you can be honest with yourself that that's what's going on sometimes the best thing that you can do is remove yourself from the company enough to allow other people to shine and put them in the position where you do allow them to shine and in the meantime, while you're doing that, a great thing to do is to go work on personal development and work on yourself so that you can come back a better person and a better leader as well. So good. Um, I want to I want to touch on, on on that a little bit. So when an employee comes and says, hey, I think I have a great idea. I think I have something that might work here. Um, how do you vet that? Do you – is the quick th- – because I know most people – I shouldn't say most people. A lot of business owners will shut it down completely. Hey, nope, your job is go do this. Um, but correct. The best thing is to r- let them run with their plan. Give them some ownership. Talk a little bit about, sure. about giving employees ownership. Sure. Maybe even some of the things that uh, helped your ascension. You know, from salesperson to to being the top mm-hmm. salesperson, being sales manager. Was there was that given to you? Was ownership given to you? In, in that in that as well. Um, I, I do get draws from the business and have things in place that I, I can't really talk about at the moment. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of yeah. pass, go past no, no, that for a little bit. I guess bit, what I'm saying, ownership, right. um, um, I, I'm not necessarily talking. Yeah, like them, them like getting that, you know, saying, hey, that oh. problem, yeah, your problem. Run with it. You know, you, you come up with a solution. For sure. You know? For sure. Yeah, 100%. Right. 100%. But in a happy way, not like you do yeah. it. It's like... I trust you to get this done. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think it, let, let's kind of go back yeah. to the what happens if somebody brings you an idea, right? You know, there's, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you're the only mind in your company, like we've talked about, you're going to have problems. And so I think it's important to have a team yeah. of people at the top that are trusted. If somebody brings me an idea, I might not love the idea, but it's going to get shared with the leadership team before the idea is either accepted or shut down. Right. I don't want my mind to make all the decisions with inside of our company. That's the last right. thing that I want. Um, and then moving forward, you know, I if if it's somebody's idea, absolutely. I want them to take it and run with it. Yeah. And I want them to get all the credit. That almost for it as well. like draws people in. Right. Like whenever our as an employee, whenever our ideas are like, hey, yeah, you know, run with that. We do. We take a level of ownership with it and we're like, OK, I'm going to carry this plan out. I'm going to it's like their effort does increase because it's theirs, right? It's like, that was my idea um, versus always saying, Hey, I'm going to go right. operate your plan all the time. That gets old, you know? Um, and, and building a culture of sharing sure. ideas of saying, Hey, I, I think there's a problem here. Um, you know, how can we fix this? You know, cause one idea might lead to another idea, which might lead to another solution um, that helps everybody, you know? Um, Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, Yeah, Mm -hmm. usually that's where like transparency comes in too. Um, That's something that I've tried to instill is just like being transparent um, for the most part, like as much as I can. And I think you do a pretty good job. I I remember hearing a conversation, you're telling us about how you had to give someone feedback and it wasn't necessarily hard. It was hard feedback you had to give, but it wasn't necessarily done in a way that made that employee hate you. I think they ended up working much harder. And, um, you know, it's just something that I think you do very well where feedback is just, and feedback and transparency is important there. Well, it's like you have to have those Absolutely. other things, you know, um, 
You have to have the trust. You, they have to know that they have to know that you care about them away from what they're doing for you, right? I think I think uh, we, it's easy, and this is where we start getting to the fake fake leaders. Is um, we always think about what we're going to get in return instead of just saying, you know what? No, 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 no. Um, I know that if I just care for this person, things are going to. I'm, I'm going to be fine. I'm. Just, it's just it's about this person. Um, and it, it it's so easy to nowadays with technology to like actually mm. put in the action behind telling people that you care about them with inside your company, like just little things, for example, Uber eats, right? It's pretty much everywhere. Now you've got an employee that calls in sick rather than I wonder if they're really sick, taking the day off Man. freaking send lunch to their house. Right. Yeah. You've got an, got somebody like I, I, I had a, a female employee have surgery. I had my wife go to her house to check in on her and take dinner for the kids. Cause I knew she had kids. Like little things like that are so simple, Absolutely. but they go such a long way. Mm -hmm. Such and a long like way. I said, it goes back. It goes back to they, they feel cared for, which means that they're going to receive the feedback that you give them, um, a lot more easily. You know, I don't even know if that's the right way to say it, but they they are. You know, they they they, they really are. They're going right. to go into it because they already know they have that sense of caring for them. That and then if Kason pulls them aside and says, "Hey, we got to we got to fix some things here." Here's some constructive feedback. Um, they're going to be like, all right. And right. especially if you, you're willing to help them fix it because you're the leader. For sure. Yeah. It's like that ATM, that feedback ATM. We talk about that in the group where it's basically right. positive feedback is $1. Yeah. Negative feedback is taking one out of the ATM. You can't take anything out of negative. Otherwise, you get punished. But if you have a good balance in there, you could take a little out and it doesn't make a difference. Now that we're talking about money, let's talk about dividends. I can promise <laughs> you any time that I have sent one of my employees dinner, it has paid me out a whole lot more than the hundred dollars it cost me to send their family Uber Eats. Absolutely. You know, it, uh, you, people forget there's yeah. all different types of investments that you can make. Yep. You know, going to the gym every single morning, that is an investment of your time and energy into yourself. You know, doing something nice, sending flowers if if a family member, somebody's family member dies to their funeral. That is an investment into your staff, your employee. Um, so many different ways, and they all pay dividends. And that's where right? you know, they all pay thinking dividends, bigger. So. Small minded people typically don't think about that. Oh, it's I'm losing fifty bucks right now. No, 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 no. What if that person just gives it a little bit more right. during the sale next week <laughs> and he closes a five thousand dollar sale? You know, so it's just it's such small and it's For such sure. it's For such sure. like a a, a, a taker mentality. Like, no, we need to be givers. You know, it's like, no, the giving thing to do would be just send them in and I'll get, you know, it's how the universe works. It'll somehow come back to me in some way. Um, right. Or, or what if, you know, one of your top producers gets a better job offer, more money job offer somebody else, but yeah, they tell them no. Yeah. Right. Everything in this is, yeah, I, I follow John Maxwell, um, one of the leadership you know, gods, I would say, um, everything rises and falls on leadership. And, uh, and I think if you guys can hear one thing, it's not about the title. It's about how you behave. It's about your actions. Leaders, you can't just slap a label of leader on anybody, right? Leaders do the work. They take the action. Um, they show up when they need to show up. They take responsibility. They take on problems that th probably they didn't have to take on. They stay late. They show up early. They work at the times that people don't want to work. Um, Everything right there is about being a leader. I have a few things to share that I wrote down. I have about 20 things actually, but I'll, 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 I'll trim the list down. <laughs> the mark of a great leader. Um, and if there's something you guys disagree with, let me know. Um, but I, I, I would say that a lot of these things, and a lot of these things we already already covered, truly care about, you, you, I mean, you have to truly care more about your people than your projects. Um, see so many cultures where they prioritize projects over people and people leave like crazy. Um, cause they, they, they know what you're about. You're, you're worried about what you're, you need the business to get done, not about their lives. Um, so people have to know that you care more about them than your project. And I think you see that in some of Kaysen's examples, um, in, uh, what he's doing. That means you have to know the status of your people. And how do you know the status of your people? Like where they're at, what's going on in their life? Uh, you have to engage with them. Case, and how many times are you having conversations with your employees just to see not just where they're at in the business, but life? Yeah, 
I want to talk more about life than business most of the time anyways, right? We we handle business with inside meetings and there's there's parts of my company at this point where I have other leaders in place that I don't really have to worry about what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I, every single day I go around and, and I, I'll make notes for myself too. Like, okay, so-and-so's son's birthday is next Tuesday, right? Set a reminder for myself. Um, you know, so-and-so's doing a, 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 a half Ironman in a month. Remember to check in on that. So yeah, absolutely. You always want to be involved in and uh, interested yeah. in their personal and, life. You know, as because well. I mean, even when things aren't going right, if they're they have poor performance, hey, you know, they just went through something. Be having understanding of that. That that's going to affect their professional life too. If some, yeah, if, if somebody on my team has poor performance, I'm always yeah. asking what's going on in their personal life before yeah, right. I'm instead of about just getting why pissed their performance and, uh, is poor. You know, um, correct. Yeah. yeah. Assume positive build trust is another thing. Absolutely. The mark of a great leader have to build trust. That means, you know, the things that Kaysen was saying, you have to be integratable, uh, respect other people, you know, it, 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 just the caring for other people, admit your wrongdoing. That's what an integral personal person does is, Hey, when you're wrong, you're wrong. And you know, and, and that's that, and you don't got to hide it. You don't got to blame it on somebody else. Um, that's when you truly see, uh, a great leaders whenever they're doing those things and it builds trust within their culture have to be mission minded. Um, case in touch on that. The first thing he said was, Hey, you have to have a vision and you can see how much goals and visions are, uh, kind of the backbone just of a high performing person in general. Um, you know, people want to belong to something. We are tribal individuals. we like being parts of groups. Um, so if you don't have, uh, vision in your company, mission in your company, if that's not just baked um, into your culture, you are missing out on your employees feeling like they are, for one, accomplishing what they want to accomplish, but two, pushing where, you know, you do need to push them, you know, uh, where you want to go. The people that are going to bring you there are your employees. You're, you're not going to bring you there. It's other people. Um, but Case, and I want to touch on one thing. You, you Obviously, in a company your size, you have probably a leadership team underneath you. You have your, you know, probably some managers. Um, obviously, you're not able to go talk to all your employees, right? But how much are you focused on giving to your direct managers, caring about them, so they go do that same for the people? It's almost like a a, a tree effect. You know, you care about five people; they care about five people each, and that all started from you. Correct. Well, I'm the way that I look at it. I'm I'm showing the the other leaders and managers with inside my company how to care for their team by how I care for them. I'm showing them how to communicate with their team by how I communicate with them. So I take it very seriously. I have meetings with them on a weekly basis. Um, I've got an open door policy. Anybody can come in my office anytime and whatever I've got going on, I'll set it aside and, and we can hammer out whatever issues or talk about life or whatever needs to be talked about. But yeah, communicating with your team, I, I think as the leader, you are teaching them how to, to yeah. run their And inside of that, you're building, um, you know, how important is it to build a safe and secure culture and environment where they feel, we just talked about it, where they feel like they can come to you with anything, where they feel safe to share what they're thinking, where they feel safe For to sure. share their ideas, where they're not just going to get shot down. Um, you know, that will easily stop a person. If they're not feeling safe and secure. I mean, most people, that's just instinctual. That's what we look for is safety and security, you know, um, right. Unless you're a weird breed, like, you know, a business owner or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Yeah. If you're listening to this, you might not, but you, you gotta know not, it uh, because you know what your people are fighting for, right? <laughs> right. You got to make other, others yeah, feel for sure, important, for sure. right? Um, it's about other people, not about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to culture, there's, and and yep. culture is not always great, right? Like we strive for it to always be just next level. But you go through disgruntled employees, you go through, you know, mm -hmm. customers that are upset, and you know, just dealing with different things that can hurt the culture. But there's nothing that I've seen ever that will spread faster as a cancer in a culture 
then most especially a member from management saying something negative about another employee and then another employee hearing that a different employee because it's like hey if if you're talking about so and so behind their back what are you saying behind mine and that kills that that kind of that safety net or that blanket that you were just talking about so good you guys better be taking notes i mean this is this is this is becoming a leader one hundred and one with whole Case and Jennings. <laughs> I mean, for real, if you, I, I, if you, I, I wish people could, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we might need to make a TV show or something of following you around for a couple of days just to see what a leader does. <laughs> I mean, from the conversations I've had with you, um, from what I hear, um, several of you are just a, a, a next level leader um, that impacts obviously your business, but you impact people's lives. And I think that's, that's more important than what you do in the business world. It's the lives of the people that you're impacting along that journey. And we tend to, uh, lose sight of that. Um, this journey is about other people. It's about helping other people, other people help, you know, uh, case and Trevor kale, they lifted them up. They saw something, they saw potential in them as a job of leader. We have to see potential in someone else and then go mind that, go take it out, pull it out of them. Um, so absolutely amazing. Dan, I think we're running out of time here, unfortunately. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's ask <laughs> Case in our, in our ending forever. question and uh, let him get back to leading his people. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so Case, in every opportunity we have someone on here, we always end with one last question. And it's, it's what's one thing you could tell our listeners right now that they could do to become limitless? Ooh, (laughs) that's a good one. Um, I think that the best way to become limitless is to conquer the battle within, right? And the way that that's done is by not negotiating on your goals. So for example purposes, if if I, I personally, I keep my goals written on my bathroom mirror at home, um, I keep them on, on tape to my wall, like they're written on whiteboards next to me. I keep them everywhere. Um, but for example, purposes on that, right? Like it's, it's very, very easy, especially if you're a great salesperson to make up excuses, especially for yourself, um, that allow you to negotiate on your goals. So for example purposes, let's say I have a goal to bike 20 miles a day and you know i i travel a lot whatever so let's say my goal is to bike 20 miles a day and i get to the airport fly in late get home around midnight whatever the case is and i haven't biked my 20 miles that day my goal wasn't to get eight hours of sleep that night but it's easy to tell myself i've got a big day tomorrow i need to hop in bed and get some sleep the goal was to ride 20 miles a day i what i really need to do is get my ass on that bike and go ride 20 miles and then come home and get into bed so, you know, just stop believing your own excuses. Once you can identify them, you can stop believing them and you can start to, to conquer that battle that we'll have with ourselves. Mic drop right there. Mic drop. Um, <laughs> awesome, guys. Well, it's been real talking to you, Case, and I'm sure, look, we're going to have to have you on here again. That's the reality of it. There's so many things I'm like, man, I want to talk to Case about. An hour is never enough. Um, I'd love to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, um, tax <laughs> things for business owners. Uh, you were telling Dan and myself some some strategies, and yep. I was like, man, I need to go do that. Um, so I'd love to share it with our listeners one time. Hey, if you haven't rated or reviewed the show yet, please take two or three minutes to do so right now on whatever platform you listen on. It really helps the show rank better when people are searching for new podcasts to listen to. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook where we post daily clips from the episode. And then we're just going to ask you to share those clips, right? You never know who of your friend, friends are going to see that clip and then they're going to start listening to the episode and then their life changes because they hear something that really helps them overcome uh, a challenge that they're experiencing in their business. Um, it's really going to help them create breakthrough in their business and become limitless. Also, one last thing. Right now, we are offering a free seven-day trial into our Inner Circle group, Limitless Business Owners Inner Circle. And inside this elite group, you get to learn how you can experience immense, consistent growth inside your business where you learn the strategies and tactics to grow your business, right? Surround yourself with like-minded people, other business owners that are experiencing what you're experiencing that are going through it right now that you can build key relationships, relationships with and learn from 
and also some people ahead of you that can also teach you something that's going to help you overcome something in your business right now. And then last thing, you can leverage the strategies and tactics it takes to build your dreams and fulfill your purpose. Talk soon. 